Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord. Our most gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for this another day that you have given us. We, let us use every day and every way to bring glory to you and to testify to others who do not know you. We thank you for all the many blessings that you pour upon us each and every day. Please, Father, forgive us when we neglect to give you thanks. We pray for our unsaved friends and family. We pray that something we or others might say or do might open their eyes to their sin and help them to realize their need for a Savior. We pray for members of the congregation that are currently afflicted with COVID. We are thankful that the White family, uh, other members of the White family have not contacted COVID at this time. We pray for the healing of, of others in our, in our congregation that are currently afflicted with COVID, and we pray that, you're, that you would lay their, your healing hand upon them. We pray for others who may be suffering in other ways, physically and spiritually. May they feel the presence of the Holy Spirit and may they be healed. We pray, pray for John Sherman. We are thankful that his leg did not have to be amputated, but we pray for his healing, Lord. For Brother Tito, we pray for his family, for him and his family, that you be with them, that they, that they would bless them in every way. We pray for our leaders all over the world, Lord, that they would look to you for guidance in the decisions that they make. Continue to bless Pastor and Mrs. Brown as they fellowship with their family and friends. And we pray that you would bring them back safely to us. This evening, allow your word to speak to us. Give us a desire to learn more about you as we study together. All these things we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, let me get back to where'd you go? Okay, I trust that you can all see that first slide there. Not yet. Not yet? I I can't. Can anyone else see it? No. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Give me a second. Okay. How about now? No dice. Yes. Oh, no, there it is. Okay. Do the slides, are the slides changing? They are. Okay. Yes. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, last week we left off with uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 11. So we're going to begin uh, with uh, verse 12. We'll do. Uh, Philippians 3, verses 12 through 21, to begin with. Um, verse 12 reads, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Now, Paul has, has just spoken about his future death and resurrection with Christ. Um, someday he will be made complete, and perfect before the Lord. And that was in the last week book in Philippians 3, verses um, 10 and 11. He begins a new section in this verse, starting with an important qualifying statement. Paul does not want his readers to think that he saw himself as perfect and sinless. He is clear that his life is a work in progress. Paul has not yet been made like Christ in a resurrected body. 
and he has not yet reached the point of being without sin. This accomplishment is something which only happens when we are perfected in heaven. Instead of claiming to be perfect now, Paul continues to pursue becoming more like Christ. A Christ-like life is not a moment to achieve, but a goal to pursue. Paul knows he would never be perfect in this world, but instead made it his ambition to become increasingly like Christ in this life. Verse number 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Paul's goal is perfection, but he has not yet reached it. He is not faultless, nor does he expect to achieve perfection before his death. Instead, he uses the analogy of a runner and a race to depict the motivation of his spiritual life. Like a dedicated runner, he has a single goal. Just as a runner cannot be successful unless they concentrate on the race, neither can Paul be successfully growing in Christ if he allows other goals to interfere. Continuing the running analogy, Paul also chooses to live by an important principle keeping his attention on the road in front of him. A runner cannot look back and still focus on the goal ahead. The two ideas are mutually exclusive. A runner's goal is to focus on the next step toward his or her goal. Paul's spiritual life is the same. He will not look back to past steps, but focus on improving each step in his race until reaching the goal of being with Christ. Christians can learn from their past, but we are not bound to the things that we have done. Instead of being chained by our past mistakes, we can move forward knowing that we carry Christ's forgiveness. Verse 14 reads, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling, high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul has used the analogy of a runner who focuses on the goal ahead of him. This prevents distractions and stumbling. Paul's spiritual goal is stated directly here, the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. As verse 13 notes, Paul's focus is on forward momentum, not prior mistakes. A person cannot move ahead if their thoughts and visions are focused on the past. Paul has a clear goal, being in heaven with the Lord. He looks forward to the ultimate reward for his faithful service. This prize is to be with Christ, though there is some uncertainty about what he specifically meant in the context of this remark. Is this upward call a reference to the rapture or to his death? Paul does not appear to distinguish between these two ideas, at least in this context. He simply writes about the goal of pursuing Christ until he meets with him after this life. This is a useful focus for believers today as well. The point is not to worry so much about whether we will die first or if Christ will return. Rather, we should be prepared, be prepared for whenever and however we meet with Christ. Paul's teaching was to not look back at the past, but instead to focus on what we can do today and in the days ahead to live for Christ until we meet with him. Verse 15, let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this, even this unto you. Now, in verses 12 through 14, Paul discussed how his life is a work in progress. Paul's not perfect, and he knows it. Rather than dwell on the past, he is committed to the future. Like a runner focused on the road ahead, Paul serves God intent on his ultimate goal, which is eternity with Christ. Here he transitions 
to the application of those teachings. This perspective is the result of wisdom, maturity, and experience. Paul expects his readers to join him in pursuing Christ above all else. He believes so strongly that this is the correct approach that he leaves no room for excuses. Though Paul elsewhere speaks of room for disagreement about Christian believers, we see that in Romans 14, this is one point on which there is no room for alternative views. If anyone did not agree, Paul's hope was that God would change his or her mind. These words are important for one primary reason. The, the goal of becoming more Christ-like does not apply only to Christian leaders. This is not a call only for super-Christians. It is to be the goal of every believer. The path Paul provided was the expectation for every Christian in the Church of Philippi, as well as our own congregations today. As believers, we are taught to consider everything in life worthless in comparison with knowing Christ and becoming more like him. There are a variety of gifts and callings, but there is only one attitude to have when it comes to growing spiritually. Pursue Christ above all else. Verse number 16. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Verse 15 sets a lofty goal, putting the pursuit of Christ above all things. Paul calls on all Christians to seek fellowship with Jesus first and to treat every other concern as rubbish. Verse 16 seems to be something of a concession to encourage those who know they are not walking in that path yet. At the very least, his readers were not to fall back into previous simple practices. This is part and parcel of his runner's analogy. Move forward and focus on Christ. As a minimum, he expected believers to not lose progress in following Christ. In terms of his racing example, Paul is encouraging the Philippians to not lose ground, even if they don't feel they're gaining it. An interesting connection is also seen with the words translated attain in verse 11 and hear. In verse 11, the Greek word of, is katanteso. In verse 16, it is ephthasemi. Both involve the concept of, of achieving, accomplishing, or arriving. In verse 11, Paul's focus was to attain the resurrection of the dead, referring to his future with Christ. In verse 16, the focus is on holding on to what has already been attained, though not the main point of this passage. Paul connects with the idea of believers who have confidence in their salvation, a theme he and others address elsewhere in the New Testament, uh, specifically Romans chapter 8, verses 37 through 39, and 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. Okay, so let's pause there. Any discussion on those first five verses, 12 through 16? Anything that you'd like to bring up about what was said or any thoughts that you may have on the verses themselves? You know, you you went over that one verse that the high calling of uh, God in Christ Jesus and the way you brought that out was different than uh, what I understood it to be, but that's, okay. that's a good good way to look at it i always looked at that verse as we're, if we're called of god that's a high calling because yeah. if we're called of god then he expects us to do something to be witnesses for him so I, i've always thought of it that is we've been called of god we've accepted christ as lord and savior that's the high calling that he's given us that well other people are having had the same calling they're they're not accepting the call that that uh uh, that we did. Right. Okay. Anyone else have? I've got a question. What is it that Paul is pressing on to make his own? 
kind of answered that already. But what is what is he pressing on to make his own? Actually, you just said it. <laughs> the uh, the high calling of Christ. Um, just personally, what is encouraging about the fact that Christ Jesus has made you his own? What? Why would that encourage you? Or why would that be encouraging? I would say that um, because we are considered his own, um, we have access to him. So we're able to be able to to go to him for whatever it is that we need. Um, just having that access and that connection to him by being referred to as his own or as, as the Bible say, a friend of God. Yeah, we are not without help. What, what, I, what I'm encouraged about is, well, I, I know what kind of person I was before and that God looked in, in my, my life and, and, and the way I was living and he called me out of that darkness. And that's, that's a wonderful thing that he didn't give up on me, even though I wasn't looking for him. He came looking for me and I thank him for, for that and making me his own. To go with um, <clears throat> what's already been said, I completely agree that it's very encouraging because we don't deserve it. Yeah. Uh, above all things, we definitely don't deserve the grace that we receive. So that's why they call it blessed assurance. You know, it's definitely something to take encouragement in because Christ made us his own through his own sacrifice because he cared that much for us. Thank you. Okay, on to verse number 17. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an ensample. The goal of a Christian is to become more like Christ. Since his focus is entirely on this goal and he considers all other pursuits rubbish, Paul teaches his readers to mimic his approach. Paul's best teaching tool is more than a letter, it is his life. Paul can appeal to his own example as a model for his readers because his focus is on Christ. And this shows clearly in his words, actions, and attitudes. Paul's suggestion is not coming from a sense of arrogance. He has already noted his own imperfection. Paul also teaches the Philippians to look to the example of other godly people. In a time before the completed New Testament, a living example was especially important. Even today, the lives of godly people seen in person or in a biography can inspire us to deeper spiritual growth. Jesus also used the tool of personal example when teaching his followers. Hebrews 11, offers the examples of other godly people given as inspiration to believers. Verse number 18, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. After making an appeal for his readers to follow his good example, and the example of other Christians, Paul's reference to those who, choose, who chose a darker path is highly emotional. Paul is confident in the truth and willing to preach it no matter what. At the same time, he feels compassion for those who reject the gospel or who wallow in sin. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, Paul wrote, For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears. Paul often expressed deep emotion, sometimes including weeping, as a response to charged situations. In this context, Paul's tears are for the unsaved. He refers to them as those who walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. These words prove that Paul was not a man who coldly or arrogantly defended his opinions. He had sincere, loving concern for the souls of these lost people. 
His goal was their salvation. The fact that they did not know Christ caused him much grief. His tears were probably not only for the souls that were lost, but also the fact that Christianity counted so many enemies. Even today, believers are called to pray for our enemies. That's from Matthew 5:44, and care for sinners, James 5:20, in the hope that God will turn their hearts towards Jesus. Verse number 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame who mind earthly things. In verse 18, Paul expressed his sorrow over the plight of unsaved false teachers. In this verse, he offers four descriptions regarding their behaviors. First, these false teachers are not simply Christians who misunderstood a portion of the gospel. These are unsaved individuals rejecting the gospel itself and who will experience destruction apart from faith in Christ. Second, for false teachers, Paul notes their focus on greed. Many false teachers then and now seek money in order to make a profit rather than truly serving the Lord. In contrast to Christ-like believers, false teachers are more concerned with their own desires than the needs of other people. Third, these false teachers call evil good and promote sinful actions as being right. More than simply excusing sin, they celebrate it and take pride in it. Fourth, the goal of false teachers is not on Christ and being with him for eternity. In contrast with Paul's teachings throughout chapter 3, their goal is on the here and now. Their only thought is what they can get out of life and other people today. All four of these traits are posed as the opposite of what believer, believers should pursue in following Christ. Believers are to know Christ, be humble, promote what is right, and set their minds on heavenly things. There's number 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In contrast with false teachers who focus on earthly things, believers should have a much different perspective on life. As Paul notes, once again, our homeland is in heaven, not here on earth. Responsible citizenship is important, but our ultimate destiny isn't in this world but with the Lord in heaven. Jesus likewise taught that his kingdom is not of this world, John 18, verse 36, and that he is not of this world, John 8, verse 23. Instead of temporary things on earth, a believer's focus is on Christ and his return. We should not focus on greed, sin, and the things of this world. Instead, our concern ought to be on what pleases God. The apostle believed Jesus could come back at any time, teaching Christ will come as he promised at any moment. Believers are to live holy lives prepared for his return. Further, we are to help make disciples of all nations, sharing the good news with others so that they can also spend eternity with the Lord. Verse 21, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. This verse ends the passage on a positive note. Saved believers can look forward to a time when every pain and problem with our earthly body will be exchanged for a new and improved body, one that will last forever with the Lord. The power that will create our new bodies is unlimited. Paul's description refers back to Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Philippians 2, 10 through 11. He is the name that is above every name, Philippians 
2, verse 9. Jesus is equal with God, Philippians 2, verse 6. And all things are subject to him. Paul reminds his readers that this perfect God with a perfect resurrected body certainly has the power to return and provide a glorified body to those who believe in him. Believers can take comfort in their future knowing God has the power to transform our bodies and keep us secure with him in his coming kingdom. Once again, discussion on those five verses or any of the other verses that we've covered or anything that's been said. Okay. I like that. Apparently, I, I like. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I really like that the the promise in that last for we're going to be made like him. Well, yep. I may not be feeling well. My my wife may not be feeling uh, well. One day we're we're not going to have this this sinful body, and none of the things that afflict us today will be bothering us anymore. And that's just something to look forward to. Most assuredly. Anyone else? Just I think the comment that he made earlier about um, yeah. let me go back to the verse real quick. Say, make sure you mark them that walk, so as ye have us for an example. For he, for for many walk of whom I've told you often, and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. You know, that's just a reminder of how important it is to know people by their fruit. Just like the word says elsewhere, you know, we don't want to be led astray because we are not rooted and grounded in the word ourselves, but we definitely got to make sure we follow the right kind of examples instead of being led astray. We see a lot of that going on in the world now. A lot of false teachers spreading a lot of false doctrine thinking, you know, trying to spread things that like God is love, this, that, and the other, but going to ignore all the things that God doesn't like. A lot of things that will send a lot of people to uh, eternity in a place that you don't want to spend. So definitely got to be mindful of uh, who we follow. Thank you. Anyone else have anything to add to that? Okay, on we go to the fourth chapter of Philippians, the final chapter of Philippians. Uh, verse number one of Philippians 4 reads, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Now, chapter and verse divisions were not part of the original biblical writings. Uh, these were added much later to make it easier to find specific passages in the text. This verse is an example of the quirks which modern chapters and verses can create. Uh, Philippians 4, chapter 4, verse 1, actually concludes the thoughts from the last verses of chapter 3. Here Paul often se offers several encouragements to his readers. First, he notes his love for them. Love is a topic mentioned many times in this letter. Uh, Philippians 1, verse 9 and 16, Philippians 2, verses 1 and 2, and Philippians 4, verse 8. Second, Paul mentions his sincere desire to visit them. He had lived with, among them in the past and missed them now while he was under house arrest in Rome. Third, he calls them my joy, another theme common in this message. Philippians 1 chapter 4, or, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 4 verse 4 and 25, and Philippians 2 verses 2 and 29. Fourth, Paul refers to the Philippian believers as his crown. These believers were reward and blessing to Paul. He concludes this section from chapter 3 by teaching them to stand firm, thus in the Lord, my beloved. He did not want to see his friends fall away from faithful service to Christ. 
Paul often taught his readers to stand firm. Examples of that are 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, Galatians chapter 1, verse chapter, chapter 5, verse 1, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. His goal for them was to stay strong and continue to grow even during difficult times. Verse number two, I beseech Iodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Paul begins this passage with two particular women within the church who apparently had some kind of disagreement. Iodia and Syntyche, Paul rarely named names when referring to disagreements in the churches. To mention these two woman, women so specifically may have indicated that they were not well known in the congregation. It might also mean that their dispute was very public, uh, particularly bitter or even both. However, their dispute did not mean these women were ungodly. In verse 3, we find they had worked together with Paul, Clement, and other godly leaders. Paul also said their names were in the book of life noting his confidence that they were believers. Even Christians sometimes have disputes which need to be addressed. Paul himself experienced a dispute with Barnabas, which led to them splitting into two separate missionary teams. Uh, we see that in Acts chapter 15, verses 36 to 41. Paul knew of this quarrel in Philippi and the need for these two women to come together to work out their differences. An unnamed church leader will later be asked to help them in this process. Verse number three. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. These two women disagreed on some issue, but they had worked together with Paul Clement, with Paul, Clement, and others. The Clement mentioned here may very well be the same man who was authored, who authored the writing Clement of Rome, or first Clement, written approximately AD 95, though this is not certain. He was at least known to Paul's readers and was in Philippi at the time the letter was written. Regardless, these individuals were all considered believers whose names are in the book of life. The book of life is mentioned elsewhere, only in Revelation. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, chapter 13, verse 8, chapter 17, verse 8, chapter 20, verse 12 and 15, and chapter 21, verse 27, where it is used six times in reference to a list of those who will live with the Lord in eternity. Verse number four, we re rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Paul returns again to the theme of joy in this verse. This time he strongly emphasizes that such an attitude should be constant, not temporary. This echoes the words of Philippians chapter three, verse one, to rejoice in the Lord. A phrase that Paul also uses in Philippians 4, chapter 4, verse 10, regarding his own actions. Believers find their joy and hope in God. Joy is part of the fruit of the Spirit, and it and is important for every believer. Paul seems especially focused on the idea that rejoicing is to take place at all times. We often forget that Paul wrote these words while a prisoner in Rome. He had been wrongfully arrested for some time, shipwrecked on the way there, bitten by a snake, and left under house arrest for two years. He had every reason to complain, yet he focused on rejoicing. Both his teaching and example provide an amazing model. Every believer should seek to rejoice in the Lord despite difficult situations, just as Paul did. Verse number five reads, 
Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. In addition, in addition to rejoicing, Paul encouraged his readers to be known for gentleness, patience, and moderation. Christians are not to be seen as easily angered or foolish, but rather as reasonable, wise people who can handle difficulties and disagreements with maturity. This is important in the context of Paul's request to Yodia and Sintish to put aside their very public agreement. Paul continues his encouragement with his hope that Jesus would return at any moment. This understanding of Christ's return has many direct applications for the life of the believer. Paul explains some of these applications in verses 6 through 9. All of these responses are positive, not negative, for the believer. Understanding that Christ can come at any moment is a source of encouragement for those who are saved not a discouragement or a source of fear. Okay, again, we'll pause for those first five verses of chapter four. Any, anything you'd like to bring out? I believe it's a good thing that um, Paul is covering these type these type of situations in this chapter because you know we all have different personalities come from different backgrounds and things like that and how we convey our beliefs and messages and understandings of what we know of the word you know they, there may be differences here and there but just like he's saying here you know we need to make sure that and like the commentary just read, I like the way your commentary um, explained it you know we need to be mature enough in our in our walk to where we don't allow small little disagreements or anything of that nature to deter us from continuing to be a, a um, tightly knit body in Christ. You know, we should be able to, you know, walk in moderation and not allow our feelings and emotions to get the best of us. And um, <clears throat> a lot of, you know, don't give the devil any room to, to create any chasm within um, the body of Christ. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, here's, a, here's an easy question. What does Paul tell the believers to do whatever their circumstances? What, what, was, what, did, he, what did he say to do? He actually, in the verse, he actually repeats it twice. Rejoice in the Lord always. That's right. <laughs> Rejoice. And that's that's not an easy thing to do. Always. Not just not just when things are going good. Always. That uh, can be quite difficult at times. Because there are times when we don't feel much like rejoicing. Yeah, we have Job as an example. What what did uh, Job's wife tell him? Just curse God and die. And what what was Job's response? Job said, should I curse? Should I only it's give God? God. Uh, so go ahead. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Should I take the good and not the bad? I mean, you know, I you know, I can't I can't accept one without the other, you know. That's right. I take it all. And, right. And and Job is a is a great example for us to it just falls right in line with uh, what Paul, I'm sure, would taught and learned of, of God. You know, whatever the circumstance is, just and it's hard. It's it is hard to do praise Him in the in the uh, the good times. I mean, in the bad times as well as the good times. But that's what He tells us to do, and it's because we should just think about He's given us salvation, which is is something that. No one can take that from you. You have to be willingly, you know, uh, to give that up. And and so we, you know, think about the joy of our salvation, and and that's all the other things just fall to the wayside, yeah. or should. We make, right. We know what's waiting for us. We. Okay. Um, to go, go along ahead, with um, go along with what Brother Dave was saying and. Another good example I like to bring up in um, 
the Bible is Joseph. You know, he's another shining example of someone who just wanted to, to, to see the goodness of God. You know, he was getting all of those dreams and everything, but those around him didn't understand what was going on in his life. And he had a lot of misfortunes and a lot of, a lot of maltreatment, you know, going to prison, being falsely accused, this, that, and the other. But, you know, had he ever um, took upon a negative attitude, you know, I don't think God would have moved as mightily in his life as he did. So apparently, that despite all the misfortunes that he experienced, you know, he still found a way to rejoice in the Lord because in the end, you know, he was on top by the power of God and put in a position where he was a, a savior to his family during the, during, the, um, during the famine. So, you know, we definitely just have to hold on to, to God's hand in the ups and downs and allow him to, uh, to, to work all things out together for good because he's always in control no matter what we may think or see. Thank you. Anyone else? Stand. Nothing else. Just stand and, yeah. and wait to see what God is going to do. Yeah. Okay, on to verse number six. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God, be made known unto God. Because the Lord is at hand or is about to return, believers should, should set their lives and thoughts in certain ways. Paul begins with a contrast between anxiety and prayer. He notes believers should be anxious about anything. This does not imply a complete lack of concern, nor does it mean Christians are to be careless. Instead, it means that believers should not be fearful, paranoid, or uneasy. Why not? Believers can speak directly with God, the maker of heaven and earth, who has all power and authority, who is in total control of the situation. Instead of anxiety, believers are to be humbly and gratefully or to humbly and gratefully approach God with whatever is on their minds. Mature prayer includes, includes thanking God for what he has done, in addition to asking for help in areas of need. This is the Christian prescription to reduce anxiety in all areas of life. This is, does not mean that believers are going to live a worry-free life, nor does it mean additional help won't be required. However, it does show that addressing problems in our lives should begin with prayer. Verse number seven. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Those who choose prayer and trust during times of anxiety will experience the peace of God. This peace offers three um, important positives. First, God's peace is supernatural and unexplainable. It is truly amazing how God can and will respond during times of difficulty. Second, God's peace will guard your hearts. The heart was seen as something to protect at all costs, since it influenced all of life. Paul held the Philippian believers Paul held the Philippian believers in my heart. Third, God's peace will guard your minds in Christ Jesus. This concept is connected with love for God and others, as well as unity. Throughout Philippians, Paul expresses concern about the unity of the Philippian church, especially in the mind. He mentions the mind again this time as a statement that unity in the midst of disagreements requires a mind controlled by God's peace. Verse number eight. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. 
Paul seems to indicate he could have written at length about rejoicing in the Lord and God's peace. These were certainly topics he would have enjoyed instead. Instead, he summarizes a list of areas of importance for believers. They include what is true, lovely, just, commendable, pure, excellent, honorable, and praiseworthy. Believers were to think about these things. While God guards our hearts, we are also commanded to focus our lives on things that please God. There is an ongoing back and forth throughout Paul's writings, which indicates God's involvement in every aspect of the life of the believer. At the same time, believers are commanded to live according to God's ways. He does the work, yet gives us work to do. Believers are called to trust in the Lord, yet also to serve the Lord. Paul set an example for how to do both. He was faithful in prayer, yet gave every bit of his life to serve the Lord. And those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Paul offers four ways in which he had offered teachings for his readers to follow. First, he referred to following the teachings that he had given them in the past, prior to the writing of this letter. These are most likely as Paul himself had developed during his ministry. Second, they are to follow what they had received from him. This probably also refers to Paul's teachings with an emphasis on oral lessons and personal interaction. It is also likely a reference to ideas that Paul had received from the Lord and perhaps the apostles, and in turn given to others. Third, they are to follow what they have heard from Paul. Again, this likely included both his written and oral teachings. These would all have been considered equally authoritative. Fourth, they are to follow what they had seen in Paul. Paul's example served as the living teaching tool to the Philippian believers. Previously, Paul has specifically asked his readers to mimic his approach. As usual, Paul's instructions are not merely meant to be known or agreed to. They are meant to be put into action. The, re the use of the Greek word prosect implies an ongoing daily effort. This is not a one-time attempt or a short-term effort to follow God. Those who followed Paul's advice can experience the incredible peace that comes from fellowship with God. Paul also uses the, term, the title God of Peace. In Romans 15.33, 16.20, and in 1 Thessalonians verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 23. Uh, the only other place that this phrase is found in the New Testament is Hebrews Chapter 13, verse 20. Verse number 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Paul transitions here to a focus of God's on God's provision in a passage running through verse 20. He begins with his recurring theme of rejoicing. Paul's initial reason for writing this letter was to thank the readers for a recent financial gift which Epaphroditus had brought to Rome. The generosity of the Philippian Christians was consistent and much appreciated by Paul. And we, see, we see that in the, the first chapter of Philippians verses 3 through 7. He recognizes that the Philippians have an ongoing and sincere interest in his well-being. Paul knew about their support for him, regardless of whether they sent additional financial help. He stresses, that, stresses this further by recognizing that prior to this gift, there had not been a recent opportunity to give financial support. More than likely, the Philippians had no one to take a gift to Paul until Epaphroditus 
left to visit him in Rome. It was only then that these believers had a safe way to send support to Paul during his time under house arrest. Okay, again, we'll pause for those five verses. Any discussion of those verses or anything that was said or any of the prior verses? Okay, in verse 6, what's the difference between prayer and supplication? Any, anyone like to try to answer that? Uh, I guess um, <clears throat> prayer is, you know, just our general communication to God, um, you know, thanks and, and showing him reverence for who he is. And I would say supplication is uh, something that's more so, more a little bit more intense of a conversation with God, maybe in regard to something he stand in need of or healing of something of that nature. You know, I, I think that's the basic difference. Okay. Anyone else have anything to add to that? Okay. Any other discussion regarding those verses? Okay, let's move on to verse number 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, wherewith to be content. Paul continues his expression of thanks to the Philippian believers with a reminder but he was not saying these words because he needed more from them. He wanted to show that he was humble and content. Paul could exist with or without earthly needs being met beyond basic essentials. In addition to living humbly, Paul focuses on the concept of contentment, regardless of his circumstances. Contentment is not automatic, nor is it a natural attitude. Rather, it is a learned skill. Paul's variety of ministry experiences had offered him times of plenty as well as times of need. This allowed Paul to learn how to find joy regardless of his circumstances. Writing from Roman imprisonment, he was at a time of great need. Even so, Paul expresses joy and contentment. It is important to recall that his imprisonment was not brief. He had been continually held for two years in Rome, in addition to multiple years in Palestine. Contentment was essential for Paul to find any joy in his circumstances. Number 12. I know how to be abased not to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Paul continues his discussion on the theme of content contentment, begun in verse 11. He specifically mentions the range of his ministry experiences, including plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Paul did not speak from theory in this area, but from personal hardships. He had endured much in his service, in his service to Christ, including five floggings, three beatings, a stoning, three shipwrecks, and more. We see that uh, detailed in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 to 29. 
His comments here are meant to include are, are meant to include all of these situations as well as many others. Under house arrest while writing this letter, he claims to have found the secret to enduring those struggles. As mentioned previously, this is the deliberate choice to be content in the power of Christ. Paul had gone without food at times and had been given plenty of food at other times. He had lived with much and with little. He had experienced hunger and thirst, was without friends and more, noted in a letter written long before Philippians, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 and 28. Verse number 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Despite his frequent need and harsh treatment, Paul joyfully declares his confidence that God is to allow him to endure anything. Paul's words reflected the gospel teachings that nothing is impossible with God. Paul had declared elsewhere that if God is for us, who can be against us? That's uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 31. This perspective can also be found in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 32, 17 notes that nothing is too hard for the Lord. Job 42, verse 2 declares God can do anything. God's closest followers have long known that with God, nothing is impossible. Whether Abraham's promised son Isaac, the people of Israel crossing the Red Sea, of the people entering the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. God provides on time, in his time, every time. Paul's confidence can be found throughout his writings. We see examples of that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4, and then chapter 7, verse 16, chapter 8, verse 22, chapter 10, verse 2, Chapter 11, verse 17, Galatians chapter 5, verse 10, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 4. This verse can, however, be taken out of context. Paul's commitment is specifically referring to the ability of a Christian to endure under hardship and persecution. Despite well-meaning use of the words, this text does not teach that a Christian is empowered to accomplish any task simply because they are saved. Verse number 14. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Even though Paul was confident in God's provision for his needs, he expressed thanks to his readers for their concern. Their acts of generosity were a way of taking some of Paul's hardship on themselves. And of course, their acts were the way God fulfilled his promise to provide. Their kindness was an expression of the fruit of the Spirit and reflected Paul's teachings elsewhere regarding kindness to others. It is important to note that the Philippians shared or had fellowship with Paul's trouble. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 teaches, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. These believers sought to share in Paul's struggles and supplied resources to help. Paul's troubles included marks on his body from being beaten for, the, for his faith. And Paul's one other use of trouble in Philippians is in chapter 3, verse 1, when he says, it is no trouble to write to them. Regardless of the trials people Paul faced, his attitude toward God, as well as the assistance provided by other believers, helped him to continue to persevere. Now ye Philippians, know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Paul knows that the Philippian believers were the only church to financially support him, when he left Macedonia. Paul remembered their unwavering, unique support. 
The phrase beginning of the gospel is not a reference to the start of the church, but rather the initial preaching of the gospel among the Philippians. In the early days of their congregation, they helped Paul, they helped finance Paul's work, a noble action which Paul made sure to thank them for even years later. This gift is probably the same one mentioned by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 8, received when he was in Corinth. Interestingly, Paul refers to their financial gifts as a partnership with me in giving and receiving. They gave financially and received spiritual benefits. A similar relationship exists today between local churches and those they support in ministry and missionary activities. Through financial support, one local church can impact many others in faraway places through the people they assist. This support also benefits the spiritual lives of those who give. Okay, we're going to pause there for discussion. Actually, this is this will be the end of tonight's study. But any any discussion on those uh, on those five verses or any of the first fifteen and in uh, Philippians 4. Well, I liked how you uh, brought brought up the point, uh, just bringing it to uh, modern day times. We should support our local church and in uh, and missionaries out in the field while we can't do the work that they're doing or haven't even been called to do that. We should support them uh, both financially and, and with prayer and with anything else that they might need. So I, I really like how you brought that out of the, the, the lesson. Thank you. Absolutely. Anyone else want to have anything to add? I just wanted the key points that was mentioned about um, how Paul had learned to be content in whatever situation he was in. That's definitely something we all can learn from because as, as we've mentioned before, you know, there's a lot of ups and downs that come with life. And unless you are rooted and grounded in something that is sure as Christ, then you won't be as resilient as you could be without Christ's strength working within us. So um, one of the verses that came to mind while you were reading through those verses was Psalm 121 and one, you know, I will look to the hills from which come my help. My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. And um, we can remember that in some of our darker moments, we would have that same inner strength drawn through Christ to, to get through our circumstances. Thank you. You know, just to add on what you uh, <clears throat> said there, Brother Tracy, uh, content. You look around the world today, you can just see people, they're, they're not content because they're looking for the wrong things. All the physical and material things of this world, they only bring temporary happiness and then they're, they're right back in the state they were in because they're, they're, they're holding on or trying to attain stuff that, that only God can give us. And that's the contentment that, you know, this world is going to pass away one day, but we'll be with him through all eternity and, and, and be content with that because none of the things in this world matter. Absolutely nothing of, of any of the things in the world matter. And Paul kind of emphasized that at the beginning, he, he counted all the former things as lost and, and, and he pressed and he's looking forward to the more important thing, being with Jesus, being with Jesus through all eternity that there can only be contentment when you have your eyes set on Christ and not the things of this world. Thank you. Amen. Anyone else? Okay, that, like I said, that's all that I have uh, prepared for this evening. I, I once again thank you for your uh, for your attention, for your uh, comments, and um, and like I always say, I, you know, I get I get uh, as much or more than you than you all do out of this every time I do it. So that's why it's not a it's not a problem for me.
it's it's a blessing. It always is a blessing. Um, well, Brother Bruce, uh, thank you for taking the lead on it tonight because I just was not feeling up to it. I appreciate it. It's like I said, it's I get more, much more out of it than I put into it. That's for sure. Glory okay. Um, if there's no other comments, I'll go ahead and close this uh, with prayer. Dear Lord, we, we thank you for witnessing to each of us as we study your word. We pray that we would share it with those that we meet so that they too can share with us in the joy of your salvation. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us the remainder of this evening. Watch over our families and, and be with us as we go about our daily tasks. Help us to ensure that we do all at all we do as unto God. Continue to watch over and protect us, and we'll be careful to give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all.